welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us. We have some people joining us online and we have some people in person. Today I'm going to talk about connecting health policy to research community and education. Today is the first of uh, four days of events for the launch um, of the new Center for Health Policy here at HSC. We kicked off this morning with a presentation by Dr. Monica Gutierrez titled The Road to Advocacy, a Marathon and a Sprint. And if you missed it, I encourage you to have a look at the recording on, online, which we'll be posting on our website. What I hope to do with this presentation this afternoon is to kind of, by the end of it, give you some indication of who we are as the Center for Health Policy, what we do, and why we do it. So I'm, I'm going to start with a quote. Um, so Sir Michael Marmont, who's the uh, prof of EPI at uh, EPI and Public Health at University College London, said this, why treat people and send them back to the conditions that make them sick? And so it has always had to be more than about only treating the sick. The absence of disease alone isn't what makes people healthy, and prevention is critically important. And so I am first and foremost a physician who is committed to treating people's illnesses and making them well again, but for me it has always had to be more than about only treating the sick. I'm going to give a definition of policy because people often mistake policy as being only related to government, right? But policy is a course or principle of action adopted um, or proposed by a government, organization, party, business, or individual. Um, levels of policy influence can be at the government level, um, which can be local, state, or federal. It can be at the organizational level, so any organization, including academic medical centers, corporations, and smaller community organizations, right down to your mom and pop local businesses. Policy can have influence at individual health systems levels, and it can also have influence at the level of individuals, the level of you and me. So I'm going to take a trip down memory lane um, back to where the connection between research and health policy started for me. So it was way back in 2005, at the beginning um, of my, my PhD in public health and community medicine. And you'll see the reason why, why I, I go back to this work. Papua New Guinea is just north of Australia. The east side of the island is Papua New Guinea. The west side of the island is Indonesian territory. It's a low-income country that back in 2005 at Port Moresby General Hospital, which Port Moresby is the capital, it's a tertiary re referral hospital. There were two pediatric wards back then with about 5,000 admissions per year. There were some challenges around pediatric HIV diagnosis and access to HIV care. And identified problems at that time were difficulties in HIV diagnosis in the pediatric um, population being a significant barrier to access to antiretroviral therapy. And then there was a clinical triage approach to testing in high prevalence resource limited settings that was inadequate to prevent HIV related mortality or death in children. And so the World Health Organization at that time, back in 2005, had recently recommended provider initiated testing and counseling for all patient groups in resource limited settings. But the challenge at Port Moresby General Hospital in the pediatric department is that they didn't feel they had the resources or that it was necessary to test all the children that were admitted. And so what I did for this study, and this was one of three or, or four that I did over um, of the few years of my PhD, was to identify clinical conditions predictive of HIV infection and to develop a screening tool with a high sensitivity to help guide HIV testing um, at, the, at the hospital in the pediatric wards and to determine the likely impact of such a tool on HIV testing practice 
really important that the tool that was developed had a high sensitivity because what you want for, for something that's going to be a, a screening tool is you want to ca cast a wide net because the consequence of missing a child with um, HIV is potentially death. And so you don't want to miss anything. So you sacrifice specificity to some extent to have a tool that is, is really sensitive. And so we did a prospective cross-sectional study and we collected data over about a year. The study population was children admitted to the two, two wards at Port Moresby General Hospital, pediatric wards. Data collection was, was very detailed clinical, clinical data, both in the history and also in the physical examination of the children. And then we used univariate and multivariate um, regression analyses and models to find out which of these clinical features were significantly associated with, with HIV infection, and then developed an algorithm algorithm. We validated it on a, on a split sample analysis. There's some, some issues with that methodology, but that, that was what we did. And so we enrolled nearly 500 children, nearly 10% of all admitted patients. They were young with a median age of 11 months, and 55, 11% of them were HIV positive, again young, with a median age of, of seven months. Gender distribution was more or less equal. And so the things that we found to be significantly associated with HIV infection were persistent fever for a month or more, being underweight for age, and having enlarged lymph glands or lymphadenopathy, and having what's called oral candidiasis or, or oral thrush. And from there, we developed this algorithm. If the child is low weight for age, um, has a persistent fever of a year of a month or more, has enlarged lymph nodes in, in specific areas, so the neck, the axillae, and groin. And if they have any evidence of oral candidiasis, you should test them. And if they don't have any of those things, you, it's unlikely that they have HIV. And so, so why am I talking about this in, in relation to policy? So there is something called the Standard Treatment for Common Illnesses of Children in Papua New Guinea. It is one of the longest standing guidelines in the world. It's been around since the 70s. The 10th edition was published in 2016. It's published every five years. And I think because of COVID, the 2021 11th edition isn't, isn't out yet. Um, but it's a manual for not just physicians, but for nurses, community health workers, health extension officers, and physicians because it takes that breadth of people, of healthcare workers, to care for children in Papua New Guinea where there is a, a shortage of doctors. And so there on page 62 in the 2016 edition and highly likely in the 2021 edition is this guideline that I developed, this algorithm that I developed 12, you know, 15 years ago. And so Community and collaboration were essential to, to that work. This is me back in, I think, 2006 with Professor John Vince, who is a British-trained pediatrician that came to Papua New Guinea in 1972 for a two-month contract and never left. And um, Dr. Mabumo Kiramat, who is also a pediatrician, uh, was then a pediatrician at Port Moresby General Hospital, and she now um, is the country lead for CHAI, which is the Clinton Health Access um, Initiative. And so I was really embraced by the pediatric community, which is just rooted so strongly with community engagement in Papua New Guinea. There was direct research capacity building among the doctors, the nurses, and laboratory staff to do this type of work, and I was involved in that. There was larger education of the range of healthcare workers that I mentioned before that deliver care to children in PNG, not just doctors. And there were opportunities for lay person patient education and health promotion that I was less involved in because of the language um, barrier, but certainly the pediatric department was involved in. And so building on that foundation, the, the work that I have done has always focused on social determinants of health, on strong community relationships, projects and programs that are aimed at real world questions, Strong relationships with policymakers are important at all levels, so organizational, health systems, government, local, state, and federal in the context of the United States. And the predominant question is always, how can I help solve or mitigate this problem 
or issue, but moreover, it's what does the community this affects have to say about this problem or issue, and do they have a voice in ideas to solve or mitigate it, and or in this particular effort that I am thinking may possibly um, be a solution. So that level of community engagement is, is critical. It's taken time to learn to do this, but, but learning to be an honest broker, not advocating for specific solutions, that's really important in assisting policymakers to understand the two options, right? The two extremes and what their consequences are. And then this, and I'm going to talk a bit more later about storytelling, but I've really honed my ability to tell a compelling story about the science. And telling a compelling story about the science isn't writing a journal manuscript. And then also developing my ability to not just analyze as we do um, well as researchers, but to synthesize the information. And then this, to learn to be patient, because it's a long way from an idea in your head <laughs> um, to a vision, and a long way from a vision to a grant. And similarly, it's a long way from a policy to implementation of that policy. And so you have to learn to be patient, to be patient over years. And so fast forward to 2022, and I'm, I'm here at the Health Science Center, um, and we have this new Center for Health Policy. The Center for Health Policy is built on three pillars. So community, research, and education. And those three pillars are underpinned by health equity, the translation of research into policy, and the practical and effective implementation of policy. We focus in, in these our early months and years on three things, telementoring and workforce development, on rural health, and on whole health. And these things are likely to evolve over the coming years. We're likely to focus on, on more areas, but that's the bulk of what we focus on right now. So what do we do and, and why do we do it? The Health Science Center is a boundary organization, and that describes an organization that sits at the intersection of the knowledge and policy spheres, and the Center for Health Policy can and will strengthen our positioning as an organization at that interface. Along with producing new knowledge, the Center for Health Policy will be a trusted source of information um, for policymakers. What we do is rooted in community collaboration and community investment, and we will carry out and facilitate high quality, innovative research and evaluation that translates um, into policy. We support practical health policy implementation and recognize, as I said earlier, that the absence of disease alone does not make a person healthy. We support developing and nurturing researchers, clinical service providers, students, community members to understand that it's both a challenge and necessity to translate research into health policy. And the use of science in the policy cycle is important, as is, as is the importance of incorporating health policy into who they are and what they do. And so we have some guiding principles that are connected to the values that we have as an institution here at the Health Science Center. We're a value-based organization. We at the Center for Health Policy believe health policy and advocacy will create solutions for healthier communities. We're committed to high-quality, innovative research and evaluation across multiple disciplines that informs the creation of solutions for healthier communities. We're dedicated to ensuring health equity and improved outcomes with an emphasis on marginalized populations and serving others first. And we believe that community outreach and engagement with genuine sustained relationships, I'll say that again, with genuine sustained relationships are essential to the work we do. We value collaboration and the integration of public health, population health, medicine, and health policy and we support the development and mentorship of the current and future healthcare and research workforce. And so in a lot of presentations, you have right at the end, thanks to the team, right? Thanks to the people um, that have been involved in whatever the presentation is about. And I want to 
upfront um, pretty early thank um, the Center for Health Policy team because they have, you know, just hit the ground running or sprinting with the startup of the, the center over the, the last month. So I want to thank Alexis Brown, who's one of our research assistants, Sade Jones, who's the senior administrative coordinator for the for the center, Ara Choi, who's a senior research associate and statistician, Kristen Cathy, who's a senior project coordinator, and Trisha Melhado, who's our senior research specialist and evaluation staff lead. We are currently hiring, so um, we're hiring a senior pro another senior project coordinator and research assistant, so please um, have a look if you're interested at these postings. Within the Center for Health Policy, we have an affiliated faculty program, so we welcome faculty interest in faculty affiliation from across the Health Science Center and from external organizations. Affiliated faculty will prim primarily have to be actively contributing to or collaborating on at least one of the research, education, community policy, and other activities of the center. And in you know, return, it's a, it's a bilateral relationship. The re resources and support that we will provide to affiliated faculty include for mentorship, grant preparation and management on collaborative grants, um, communication and dissemination, including policy briefs, and then early access to event and conference registrations for things that we, we put on, um, and networking opportunities and facilitation of collaborations. So please, if you have interest in becoming an affiliated faculty, um, please get in touch with us. So I want to move on to highlight um, some of the programs that we have here at the, the Center for Health Policy. I'm going to start with the National Rural Telementoring Training Center. That's a currently active um, program that's HRSA funded. I'm not going to talk about it in too much detail because tomorrow, as one of our launch week events, Andrea Roche is going to be talking about how telementoring can be used um, in the context of, of community health. And she'll talk a little bit more about the National Rural Telementoring Training Center there. But I can say that the goals of this national center are Firstly, to deliver free nationwide training and technical assistance to organizations on telementoring for rural clinic needs and workforce development. The center promotes telementoring best practices across six different telementoring models. We support evaluation of rural telementoring. We are a reliable, accessible source of telementoring expertise. This is something we've built over the last um, couple of years, and we, we assist in education of policymakers and other state, stakeholders on rural telementoring. All the resources that we have in the center are freely and widely available across a number of different platforms, including um, our website and a, a learning management system that we have. So moving on to a new program. So this is called Take on HIV, Targeted Access, Knowledge and Education on HIV for Health Professions Programs. It's a newly funded HRSA grant. We're in the project startup phase. It just started at the beginning of September. The HRSA grant is integrating the national HIV e-learning curriculum, e-learning platform into healthcare professions programs. As I said, the grant was newly awarded at the beginning of September. We have a five-year performance period and a funding amount of around $3 million. And what is the purpose um, of this program? So it's to integrate the national HIV curriculum into the education and training curricula of health professions programs. There's an emphasis on medical, nursing, and pharmacy graduate and residency programs, but we were not focusing exclu exclusively on those. We are focused on the breadth um, of health professions programs. It's to enhance the quality of HIV education and training at health professions institutions across the United States. And kind of the driving policy push um, from, for this um, at the level of, of HRSA, um, the grand tour, is that there is this crisis in the HIV clinical workforce with national um, shortages. And so this program aims to um, bolster the pipeline. Of course, there's a lot of other work that needs to be done, which is to plug the leak. But this particular grant is to bolster the pipeline. 
And so the National HIV Curriculum is a free educational website. It's uh, created by the University of Washington and also um, funded by HRSA. It provides ongoing up-to-date information around six core competency areas um, for HIV knowledge and education, so HIV prevention, screening, diagnosis, and ongoing treatment and care. And it's specifically focused on, on the United States. It has a lot of great features, free continuing medical education credit, um, different types of continu continuing medical ed education credit are provided depending on your discipline. And so, as I said, the, the National HIV curriculum was developed um, by the University of Washington, but it is an AETC program, and AETC stands for AIDS Education Training Centers. Again, a national program. The AETCs cover the whole country uh, regionally. Uh, they're different AETCs um, for each region, and then local partner sites underneath each regional AETC, and AETC is the source of funding within HRSA for this grant. There's some other important National HIV Curriculum partners. So this particular grant was given to just two um, organizations, us and the University of Illinois at Chicago, um, specifically to the Midwest AIDS Training and Education Center, AETC, that sits um, within that organization, within the College of Medicine and the Department of Family and Community Medicine. Another really important partner is HRSA has a cooperative agreement um, for a national evaluation plan, and that's with JSI. JSI is a global public health consulting agency with extensive um, research and evaluation expertise. And so we will be working with them on the national evaluation plan. And so who is doing um, this work for this, this new grant opportunity? It's led by the Health Science Center. I'm the program director, principal investigator, but I'm also working with Dr. Greiner, who's a co-investigator in the School of Public Health, and with Dr. Um, Hodge, who is a co-investigator in the College of Pharmacy. We have partners at UT Health San Antonio Reach Center, so that's um, the Center for Research to Advance Community Health. And we also work with Cardia, which is an organization that has extensive expertise around um, training and technical assistance and has been around for a, a few decades. We've worked with them on, on prior projects and they bring a wealth of knowledge around um, training and technical assistance in the healthcare area. We are also working with a number of AETCs, so UT Health San Antonio South Central AETC, um, Valley AIDS Council South Central AETC, which is in the Rio Grande um, Valley in Harlingen, and they have clinics in McAllen as well. We're working with um, area health education centers. Those are also HRSA funded, and AHEX can be found in uh, representing every county um, in the United States. We're working specifically with Oklahoma AHEC, which is a, at OSU, Oklahoma State University. And we're also working with South Central Texas AHEC. We have consultant agreements with other important um, individuals and organizations. So we're working with the Health Professions um, Students Organization, which is a national organization focused on health profession students. And we're also working with Dr. Jorge uh, Mera, who is the Director of Infectious Disease at um, Cherokee Nation Health Services, has a lot of experience in utilizing particularly the, the ECHO model for telementoring around um, viral hepatitis and HIV. Um, so we're excited to work with Dr. Mira. And then, uh, most importantly, we're working with um, integrating partners. So these, we're calling them integrating, partner, integrating partners, the, these health professions programs that will be integrating the national um, HIV curriculum. And we have a cohort-based approach, and I was really excited to be able to have, at the time of writing the application, uh, eight programs that had already um, committed to um, integrating um, the national HIV curriculum or had already integrating it, integrated it and were expanding or adapting that integration. Um, and so we're working with Cherokee Nation Family Medicine 
um, residency program. We're working with a family medicine uh, residency program at Dell, um, UT Austin. We're working with um, Northwestern State University College of Nursing and also with the University of Incarnate Word School of Nursing in San Antonio. And then we're working with two departments, colleges here at the Health Science Center, the College of Pharmacy, and with the Physician Assistant um, Program. And then at UT Health San Antonio, we're working with two programs, the Internal Medicine Residency Program there, and also the Occupational um, Therapy Program. So we'll look forward to working with them. And how are we going to do this work? So I'm just going to give very broad stroke overarching principles for our approach. Um, we're going to take an implementation science approach using two specific um, frameworks, REAIM and PRISM. Um, and we are going to utilize telementoring models to expose students to curriculum content in different ways to just accessing the national HIV curriculum. Um, we're going to utilize um, ECHO, uh, ex Extension for Community Health Care Outcomes, which is a specific telementoring model um, for additional exposure um, to HIV, HCV, HIV, hepatitis C um, co-infection and HIV, hepatitis B co-infection um, management. As I've already said, we are collaborating really strongly with the ATCs and AHECs. And we are ultimately going to develop what we're calling an, an integration toolkit so that, you know, by the end of the five years or maybe sooner, by the end of four years, um, we will have a toolkit where any um, health professions program that thinks, oh, right, I want to integrate the national HIV curriculum e-learning into my program will have a toolkit that they can go to that will help guide them um, to do that. Um, we are focusing um, specifically initially on the southern um, United States. Um, that was very deliberate on my part. Um, the southern United States is the epicenter of the HIV epidemic in the United States. Um, more than 50% of the new infections um, in HIV are in the south. Um, where roughly 33-34% of Americans live. Um, if you live in a southern state, your lifetime risk of an HIV diagnosis is higher than if you live um, elsewhere in the country. And moreover, if you live in the south and you happen to get HIV, you are more likely to die from it than if you live elsewhere in the country. So um, I was very deliberate about um, focusing um, on the southern U U.S. initially for this step, for this um, project. Eventually, we will expand to other parts of the country, but our focus initially is on the south. Another um, program highlight is um, what's called the Community Health Worker Training Program. Um, that's also a newly um, awarded grant of which we're a sub-awardee, also um, a HRSA-funded um, project that's in the project startups um, phase. Um, I think the start date for that was 15th of September. Um, the primary recipient for that grant is UT Health San Antonio. Um, the principal investigator program director is Dr. Jason Rosenfeld. Um, it's a roughly $3 million um, budget uh, with a three-year performance period. About 75 awards were made across the country, and it's part of American um, Rescue Plan um, funding. The purpose of this community health worker training program is to support projects that increase um, the community health worker, um, com the number of community health workers and health support worker workers. So this fits in with what the um, Center for Health Policy is focused on in terms of workforce um, development. The grant will equip them with skill sets needed to provide effective community outreach and to build trust in communities. Um, the grant will support connections to and retention in care and support um, uh, services. Um, and it's focused to some extent on recovery um, from the COVID-19 pandemic and other um, public health emergencies um, in, and focused on underserved communities. And so this combined kind of national focus for this grant opportunities this grant opportunity is intended to advance public health, strengthen the public health workforce, reduce health disparities, and help underserved populations achieve health equity. 
And so our specific role in this grant, um, collaborating with UT Health San Antonio um, as a sub award is to provide subject matter expertise um, related to evaluation, employing and employing implementation science um, frameworks for process outcome and impact evaluation. We are also going to provide such subject matter expertise related to the policy and dissemination um, component of this body of work. So I'm going to move on to another um, program highlight. So what we call the, the Monkeypox REAP program, Rapid Resources and Evidence-Based Advisory Program, and that is currently active. And the purpose of establishing this program two months ago um, was to review the current literature um, available uh, to create evidence based summary sheets on monkeypox. This is in the aftermath of monkeypox being de um, declared a public health um, emergency. And, and you know, at, a, at the time of a public health emergency, accurate uh, summarized information is, is at a premium. And we wanted to contribute to that. And so the approach that we took was um, having student-led teams. We were confident in the ability of the fantastic students that we have here at the Health Science Center to be able to do this. And so the project is, is the program is led by Dr. Crystal Hodge in the College of, of Pharmacy and myself. And we have uh, four student teams with a faculty lead. Um, one is EPI, um, the four areas are EPI and general information, clinical presentation, which I lead, um, diagnostics, um, and um, treatment. And so what we've done, and it's available at, 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 on our website, is to um, create these information sheets, um, one on EPI, um, one on clinical presentation, one on diagnostics, um, and one on treatment. So these are available on our website. Um, and it, um, we are going to work to um, create in the next iteration um, more um, information that is more directed at, um, at, the, at the general public, so at a, at a level of health literacy that is appropriate for um, uh, general public um, distribution. Also importantly, we, um, we point um, people who come to these information sheets to other um, resources that are readily available. We're not uh, by any means saying that we're the, same, we're the sole source of information for monkeypox, um, but we just wanted to provide um, some accurate uh, summarized information that we felt would be um, helpful to the breadth of, of people that work in healthcare. So now I'm going to move to, to highlight a, an, another couple of programs. Uh, now these are rooted in, in ECHO, again, another tele-mentoring model. Um, ECHO, as I've said before, stands for Extension for Community Healthcare Outcomes. And again, um, Andrea Roche, who's going to talk about tele-mentoring tomorrow, will talk in more detail um, about ECHO and other tele-mentoring models. But I want to highlight um, two ECHOs that we have um, at the Center for Health Policy. One is called the RAISE ECHO, and one is the Uvalde Behavioral Health Support um, ECHO. Very briefly, um, Mr. Roche will talk more about this tomorrow, but the principles of the ECHO tally mentoring model is that it utilizes video conferencing technology um, to create a connection between um, uh, specialists or content experts, um, usually but not exclusively, at an academic medical center, and they connect to um, individuals, which sometimes are also healthcare um, workers, but may be just community um, individuals. Um, and so an, the ECHO model improves outcomes by sharing um, standardized best practices. It's a very case-based learning approach. Um, ECHO was developed primarily as a health access tool, but one of the things I spent the last several years doing is um, promoting and supporting ECHO as a very valuable research um, and education um, tool. And so within, um, within the Center for Health Policy, we're going to be building out over the coming months um, support for ECHO 
for education and research through core services um, that we will provide and some supplemental services in a kind of a la carte um, menu way. And so the core services that we hope to, to provide will be ECHO grant writing and launch support, um, some administrative support, some support for communications and promotion around ECHO, and then just having some institutional accountability and sustainability. Um, and we'll be working closely with the existing um, strong ECHO program that's here at the Health Science Center um, in the geriatrics uh, department. The RAISE ECHO now, um, yeah, I really love this ECHO. So this RAISE starts, stands for Resources, Advice, Insights, Support, and Empowerment for Early Career um, Women Faculty. And we, I co-founded this with um, Dr. Emily Vale, who is um, now at Penn. And we attended a you know, career development workshop several years ago. And when we came out of that, um, you know, one of the things we were tasked with doing after this AAMC workshop was to try and take something of what we'd learned um, back to our, our the institution we were at at that time. And we started with um, in-person meetings. And so we'd, we'd gather women faculty and we'd meet in a restaurant and we did this for over a year, approaching a couple of years. And then COVID hit and um, we started to meet um, virtually. Um, and I thought, oh, perhaps Echo, Echo may work for this. And we launched Echo and we have never looked back. Um, we're very excited to recently have been given a shout out and endorsement by AAMC. We are continuing to grow this really robust um, community of, 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 of practice and learning um, that consists of, of, of faculty women. And we're really excited for where we can expand this in the future beyond um, just the, the ECHO. Now, the Uvalde Behavioral Health Support ECHO um, you know, in the wake of the tragedy in Uvalde, I was approached um, to see if there was anything I could do um, around uh, behavioral health support. Um, and I was approached because of my leadership of the, the National Rural Tele-Mentoring Training Center um, and, and a question around whether there were any tele-mentoring um, resources that could be provided and what I came up with and with in partnership with this leadership team that is up on this slide um, was to very rapidly stand up um, an ECHO program that was focused just on Uvalde and surrounding communities. Um, we stood it up within a few weeks and I have some experience standing up ECHOs that quickly. We did it again at the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic to stand up an ECHO that was um, to support clinics to very quickly stand up telemedicine as they needed to do um, at that time back in, in 2020. Um, and so the Uvalde Behavioral Health Support ECHO has been running for a few months now. We have the last session um, next week. We didn't advertise it um, very widely the way we normally do um, for, for ECHO because we want wanted to just focus, have it there, focused just for um, the Uvalde uh, community that needs it. And so it, it's run um, successfully and, and we were glad to, to be able to provide that service. Um, and we are going to have ongoing um, conversations with um, community members and stakeholders to see if there's any other support we can provide um, going forward. Um, now, moving on to uh, another program. So this is a health policy summer camp for rural high schoolers that's in a planning um, stage. And we are going to have the inaugural summer camp um, in the summer of next year. And why, why do this? Um, so the, the, the aim is to provide encounters, experiences, and hopefully inspiration to high school students who have never considered healthcare as a career. So this isn't directed as, at students that already know they want to work in healthcare. It's not directed at students that are already in special programs that are going to give them a leg up towards a career in, uh, a career in healthcare. It's for those students that it never occurred to that they could do this. 
And so um, we will be providing teaching tools and guidance to encourage them to find their voice and to express themselves about healthcare issues in their communities that they're passionate about influencing or changing. Um, and as I've said, we are focusing initially on high school students that live um, in rural communities. Eventually, we will expand it out to um, urban high schoolers, but that's going to be our focus for the, the first um, iteration of this camp next summer. Um, we're collaborating with um, our library here at the Health Science Center, the Gibson D. Lewis Health Science Library, and we're also collaborating with the um, TCOM, um, Texas College of Osteopathic Medicine Office of Rural um, Medical Education for the camp. So another program that, um, that I get excited about is called um, the Powerful Pens Visible um, Voices Program which we're launching this week. Um, and on Thursday, I'll be giving, um, I'll be ho um, hosting and moderating uh, a panel um, that uh, consists of, of individuals that have been exemplary um, in, in this space. I'm, I'm gonna go with another quote. So um, uh, Chimamanda Adichie is, is a Nigerian author and writer. If you're a reader, I highly recommend her books, um, you know, Half of a Yellow Sun, um, Americana, The Thing Around My Neck. They're just really great books. And she said this in a TED talk a while ago now, several years ago. Um, the consequence of the single story is this. It robs people of dignity. It makes our recognition of our equal humanity difficult. It emphasizes how we are different rather than how we are similar. Stories matter. Many stories matter. Stories have been used to dispossess and to malign, but stories can also be used to empower and to humanize. Stories can break the dignity of a people, but stories can also repair that broken dignity. And what she talks about in this TED talk um, is, she talks about lots of things, but she talks about the power in um, stories, um, the danger of the one-sided story or the one perspective um, on a story. And, you know, there's also a, an ongoing challenge in that who gets to tell the stories? Who gets to write the stories? It's not usually the people that are marginalized that get to, to have that platform. And so when you're communicating science to policymakers at, at all levels, organizational, health systems, government, local, state, federal, um, it's, you have to know how to tell the story. And, and it's not always, as I've said before, it's usually not the way you tell the story in an academic medical journal. So you have to know who you want to reach. You have to have clear and actionable recommendations. You have to repackage your work. And as researchers, we're not good at doing this, right? The, the peer reviewed journal and conference paper doesn't work. Um, you have to be able to synthesize a body of science in an understandable, different format. You still have to write well, but it's a different type of writing. And you still have to write consistently, but it's a different type of writing. You have to pick your moment. You have to know how your work fits or does not fit into the bigger picture or a current narrative, whether that's locally, whether that's nationally, whether that's internationally. You have to sustain and amplify your engagement. Um, I've talked about patients before, um, and, and you need patients, and you need genuine relationship building. And it's the same genuine relationship building that you have in successful collaborative research, research um, relationships. And so the premise of the Powerful Pens Visible Voices program is that journal manuscripts and conference abstracts are not the only places for students, staff, and faculty within an academic institution or healthcare organization to tell stories. Um, the premise is, is that the experiences and expertise of students, staff, and faculty are rich and diverse, and that there's this wealth of untold stories that, sh that should be told. And the story can be as complex as about translating research into policy, or it can be as simple as an experience that you have you know, um, with a patient that, that changes you or, or molds you. 
Um, and the academic environment is not a natural one for nurturing storytellers beyond um, the usual academic amplification mechanisms of journal manuscripts and, and conference abstracts. And so we want to... Um, we want to do some of that nurturing by providing teaching tools and guidance um, for HSC students, staff, and faculty to discover the power in their pens and encourage the visibility of their voices. And so, as I've said on Thursday, I'm going to host a, a, a panel, a moderated panel discussion with panelists who, have, who work in academia and healthcare who are exemplary in this space. And that includes um, Dr. Scott Walters, who's here at the Health Science Center. So I'm really looking forward to that conversation. And I hope you'll join us. Um, the registration details are on our website. And so one of the core things that I'm going to do within the Powerful Pens Visible Voices program at the Center for Health Policy is to partner with the op-ed project. Um, and the op-ed project, um, this is just a screenshot, um, full disclosure screenshot from their website. Um, they, their mission is to change who writes history. And why? Because they recognize that whoever tells the story writes history. And so they have a core workshop um, called Write to Change the World, which I've participated in. Um, and it's great. And what I'm going to do is the applications will open in January 2023 for HSC students, staff, and faculty to apply for slots in the op-ed project Right to Change the World workshops that will be sponsored um, by our Powerful Pens Visible Voices program. And beyond the workshop, um, we're going to continue to work with the individuals that participate um, to develop um, their skill um, in this area and, and what I hope over years, I have other plans beyond this workshop, but what I hope over years is that um, our researchers, our staff, our faculty, our students will become known even more for their powerful pens and visible voices. So um, moving on and nearly towards the end now, um, of the final program I want to talk about is the translation of research into policy lecture series. And so this is in planning and will launch um, in the spring um, of next year. Um, the Eleanor Crook um, Foundation um, is Eleanor Crook is actually the granddaughter of the founder of HEB, which is a Texas institution. It's still my favorite grocery store, and one of my regrets with moving is that I don't have one an HEB around the corner. But um, the Eleanor Crook Foundation does work um, does work related to global malnutrition. Doesn't actually do work in the United States. Um, and I was browsing through their website just just last week. Um, I often am on the lookout for um, grant opportunities for for work. Um, and so this was on their website. I don't know who said it, but um, they said on there, research without consideration of policy or systems change will always fail to achieve the fullest potential impact. Advocacy without evidence is destined to fail from the start. But when these pillars are brought together, um, the result can be powerful. And that's the power and beauty of translating research into policy. Policy takes scientific discoveries and can amplify and scale. And over time, it can entirely shift social norms. So think about seatbelts in cars. Think about smoke-free airplanes. I'm actually old enough to remember um, flying on airplanes where people could smoke. Um, think about food labels. These are all complete shifts in, in social norms driven by, by policy. And so the research community has produced a stunning array of solutions to health problems, but they are rarely translated into public policy because for lots of reasons, but academics and policymakers have different incentives. The incentive for the academic is their ability to publish in peer reviewed journals, to be cited, to get grants, to teach. Um, and they're not measured by the impact of their research and their work on people's lives. Um, policymakers, on the other hand, are focused on their government policymakers are focused on their, what their constituents needs need, um, the, the challenges their constituents face. And so there's often a communication um, gap and the two sectors fail to engage and, and communicate effectively um, with each other. There are also failures in research methods, right? And, and you know, 
that restricts the impact research researchers have. Um, there's often insuffi insufficient stakeholder involvement in the creation of the research project. Um, there's often investing in pilot projects without any thought that went into it, whether these, um, these projects are scalable. Um, and then there's often, often a lack of a plan to scale up evidence-based solutions. Um, and there's often an absence of a plan to disseminate and advocate for um, the research findings to be included in, in public policies. And so we have to evolve in academia. That zeal that we have for producing research, we have to ma match it with a desire to implement that research. Um, and we have to somehow recognize that, um, recognize that um, academics can, should, can and should um, get credit um, for that type of work. Um, we have to have relentless education and advocacy that's directed towards policymakers. Um, and academia does do this, but we really need to up our game in that area. Researchers, us as, as researchers, we just have to get out of our comfort zone. Our comfort zone is amongst our peers. Our comfort zone is amongst the people that do the same type of work that we do. Our comfort zone is at those conferences that we go to and we meet all the people that do the kind of work that we do. Um, but we have to think about different ways of communicating our work um, and to whom we communicate that work. We have to move people emotionally and we have to also communicate the impact. And this does not happen at an academic conference and it doesn't happen in the pages of an academic journal. And so the Translation of Research into Policy lecture series will be hosted by the Center for Health Policy. It will start, as I said, in 2023 with an invited lecturer every quarter, so March, June, September, and December. The lecturers, um, the lectures will have, the lecturers, that's a typo, will have regional and or national and or international reputation and expertise at the interface of research and policy. The series will initially be virtual, but as we grow and have additional funding, we hope to host lecturers in person for not just the lecture, but some events over a day or so that facilitate engagement with our students, staff, and faculty in larger um, community. I'm really excited to say that um, Dr. Sophia Bartlett, um, PhD, has accepted um, my invitation to give the inaugural lecture in March 2023. Um, Dr. Bartlett is the senior, a senior scientist for STI, sexually transmitted and bloodborne infections, STI BBIs, at British Columbia Center for Disease Control, and she's faculty at the University of British Columbia School of Population and Public Health. Her work is wonderful. Um, she addresses knowledge gaps around the overlap of STI BBIs, as well as emerging and re-emerging infections like COVID, tuberculosis, substance use disorder. Um, she does a lot of work um, in, the, um, in the incarceration space um, and her work focuses on on results that have the potential to inform public health policy and programming while advancing the rights um, and the health of marginalized um, people. So I'm really excited um, that we will have her um, at our inaugural lecture. And so um, in conclusion, I started with a quote, and so I'm going to end with a quote. Um, Paul Farmer um, passed away unexpectedly this year, and he was such a giant. Um, just a giant and in so many ways. And he said many great things, but um, one of the things that he said is, for me, an area of moral clarity is you're in front of someone who's suffering and you have the tools at your disposal um, to alleviate that suffering or even eradicate it and you act. I'm incredibly honored to hold the position of VP for health policy, of health policy here at the Health Science Center um, and to direct this new center um, for health policy. It's both a privilege and responsibility to lay foundations for the Center for Health Policy, which I hope um, will have it standing and flourishing long after um, I retire. 
Um, I look forward to working with my growing team, um, with partners and collaborators here at the Health Science Center and beyond to make that happen. So thank you for your attention. We've only got a few minutes. I know we have people joining us online. I don't know if there are any questions. No. Any questions from the audience that are sitting here? So the question, just to repeat it, was will I be taking interns from the School of Public Health? Um, yes, I'll take interns from any school. Um, I, I love working um, you know, with interns. I love, enjoy working with students. We have a lot of opportunities um, within the Center for Health Policy to accommodate, um, to accommodate um, interns and um, uh, students that may be doing electives, um, depending what their discipline is. So yes, is the answer to that. Okay, I think I'll draw to a close. Thank you so much.